I will click start now. Hello and welcome everybody to another one of the NHSR uh, community's webinars and today I've got my colleague doing a talk on a subject that I find really fascinating, unit testing in R and we've had many discussions about this over time and Tom knows a lot about this so um, I won't build, build it up too much but Tom Jemmett I'm going to pass this over to you to tell us a bit more about unit testing. Thank you very much so yeah I'm, I'm Tom um, and I work at the strategy unit with Zoe. Um, I'm a data scientist within the team I've been working in the NHS now for around 15 years almost, um, doing various different analytical roles. Um, I've got a background in computer science, so I've studied a bit around software engineering. Not a huge amount, but um, enough to be dangerous, I'd say. Um, so I'm hoping to say to give you a bit of a, a flavour for what unit testing is. Um, certainly not a for a tutorial. Um, but hopefully enough to get your points in the right direction and see why this might be something that could be useful for your own work. So, if you kind of look what unit testing, well, software testing in general is on Wikipedia, you, you get a bit of a vague, rambly quote. But the way that I tend to like thinking about it is what you're trying to do is you, you want to verify and validate that the codes that you are writing is correct, it works as intended. Um, there aren't any bugs that are present in your code. And then crucially, over time as you change and develop your code, things that you've built before suddenly don't start breaking. Um, it's giving you that assurance that what you did a year ago, two years ago, or even last week, still is functioning correctly. So, how can we test our code? Um, two kind of broad buckets that we could slot into. There's static testing and dynamic testing. So first of all, what is static testing? And it's testing without executing the code, which might sound a bit mad at first, like how can you test your code without running it? But I would argue it's, it's what you're doing constantly as you're writing the code. You're looking at it and make, making your decisions about what the code's expected to do and how you're expecting certain things to run, um, what the results should be, and getting an idea of is this code correct or not. And it's also going to happen, hopefully, if you're using a kind of code review process as your colleagues and peers are looking at the code. They're going to be making those same kind of questions and decisions and looking and deciding is what you're writing in code actually going to do what you think it is in the first place I'm, I'm sure many of us have picked up obvious errors over time and quickly corrected them um so that's kind of half a static testing but there's a, a big chunk which is a little bit vague in this point here but Compilers and interpreters and linters um, are going to statically analyze your code for syntax errors and other things. So most of us are probably writing code in R or Python, which are interpreted languages. Um, so when you type your code into um, R Studio and it says, oh, you've missed a um, curly bracket to close off your thing, that is some code that's looking at your code and checking it before it's even trying to run it to make sure that that code could run in the first place. And um, particularly if you use VS Code, um, though there are some of these features in the RStudio to a lesser extent, um, linters are bits of code that kind of look and run and find those same kind of issues of syntax errors, or um, perhaps you've created a variable that's never used, or you're using a variable that's never been defined, and it's kind of flagging up saying, yeah, I don't think this code's going to run. Um, these kind of tests that are kind of happening constantly um, for you, hopefully picking up errors before you try to run the code. But the other side of the kind of page there is around dynamic testing. This is probably um, quite easy to guess. Oops, and somehow gone to, all the way to the end of my slides. I think quarto great. Let me just uh, 
jump back to the beginning and start again. I don't know why. That's there. Um, Gremlins in the computer. This is why we need tests for that. Um, let's try this again. <laughs> so yeah, dynamic testing in what executing the code is probably what we're expecting, isn't it? That um, as we write tests, we, we need to run the code and see if we run our function with value of three, it gives us you know, whatever value we're expecting with that input of three. And again, we're probably doing this constantly as we're developing our code. You're running it in the console and you're looking and you're checking to see does, does that code that you've just wrote give you the results that you're expecting in a bit of an informal way. Um, you're just testing and making sure that the things that you've got in your head are working as intended, but nothing particularly rigorous. Um, now, there's kind of two broad categories we could fit some of our dynamic testing into, um, functional and non-functional tests. But then we're going to focus purely on the functional testing. Um, but just to kind of highlight the non-functional tests, um, these are going to be things like security testing, um, perhaps not as relevant in analytics um, as it would be in general software engineering. Um, you know, making sure that if you've got something that's asking for a, a user's credit card, is it not storing that in plain text? So we build tests to check for things like that. Um, you'd have other kind of tests like performance testing. You know, if you're running this code, does it take an acceptable amount of time to run? Is it using up too many resources? You can build tests to do things like that. Um, but the functional tests are what we're more interested in today. Um, that's does your code give you the results that you're expecting? So it's kind of hint that earlier, some of this testing is manual. Um, you, you can, well, you will be testing your assumptions as you build in the code. But we can build automated test suites, things that are going to run a consistent set of tests against our code to make sure what we think is meant to happen does actually happen. So there are a couple of different types of functional tests. You may have heard of some of these terms before. Um, so the first one that we're going to cover is unit tests. Um, and what this is doing is it's going to check each component or a unit for accuracy independently of one another. So imagine we've got a suite of functions in our little project. Unit tests will be checking each one of those functions works. Irrelevant of any of the other functions. Does that particular unit work? And if not, what are the issues? Integration testing is then checking do some or all of those components actually work together as intended. So you can imagine, um, yeah, you're right, code R with the, the pipe. Um, if we pipe one function into the next, we might be testing by integration testing. Do all of those things work together as intended? Um, and also integration testing will start to cover things like, does it integrate with databases that we might be using um, or other external resources? You then got end-to-end -end testing. So imagine you built a, um, a website, um, maybe using Shiny. Um, End-to-end -end testing is making sure that the user's experience as they're clicking through and pressing buttons and working with that whole package as a, a singular system works correctly. So that's kind of tying up all of those unit tests and integration tests together, making sure all of that code works from start to finish. Um, and then finally, we've got user acceptance testing. So this is making sure that that product that you're developing works for the user. If the user's asked for a big shiny button, have they got a big shiny button that works for someone? So looking at these four kind of broad groups here, that bottom one is a more look and feel kind of 
it, it possibly not something that you can test as automatically as others. It's very subjective. Whereas these top ones, we should be able to come up with very concrete specifications of things that we're actually asking for and testing against. So very deterministic. And of these three, we're going to be talking about unit testing alone today. Now, I suspect we're, there's probably a fair few of us listening, thinking, what is the delineation between unit tests and integration tests? And um, the, the answer is often quite blurred and difficult to delineate. Um, but by way of an example, imagine we have a little shiny app, and what it's going to do is it's going to grab some data from a database, it's going to manipulate that data somehow, and then it's going to generate a plot. So we can consider the different types of tests that we could build here. So our unit tests will be checking that the data manipulation function and the plot function, they work correctly. So what we might be doing with those is creating some sample, simple data sets, some things that can broadly test that given some usual type of data, these things kind of function correctly. An integration test then might be to wire that data manipulation function up with the plot function. So if we pass in data from that data manipulation function straight into the plot function, does that still work? And then finally, end-to-end -end tests would be running that entire application, making sure that when a user is going through and pressing the buttons and doing stuff, it's um, you know, giving us the correct plot and things like that. Now, end-to-end -end testing usually ends up with more complex tools involved, and um, certainly we'll be looking at today, you can have things like um, recording of the mouse movements as, a, as you're playing about. So you can test it against an actual web browser. So um, it's quite clever, but yeah, it's definitely out of scope for today. Um, if you start looking at some of the literature of testing, you, you might come across this testing pyramid concepts. And um, the general idea is that as we start from the top and work our way down from those end-to-end -end tests to the unit tests, the size of those tests are going to decrease. So end-to-end -end tests are going to be quite complex and hard to write. They're going to be costly in terms of development time and also costly in terms of runtime, potentially. Um, whereas unit tests, they're going to be smaller, easier to write, um, and they should run very, very quickly. And yeah, integration tests sitting somewhere in between. Um, but then the other side of that pyramid, the, um, the other axis is we're expecting there to be lots and lots and lots of unit tests, but comparatively very few end-to-end -end tests. So that's the kind of general idea that I've got that as we're building these kind of tests, we want there to be loads and loads of unit tests. And in fact, if you, there's a kind of question of how many tests is too many, it's always going to be kind of at least 10 times what you have already created properly. Um, it, it feels like a never ending task writing good tests sometimes. Um, but yeah, if you see this kind of um, diagram in the world, that's what it's, it's trying to imply. And I think it's a good aid as we're building different tests up of our expectations of what we should be building. Um, you might also see this kind of black box, white box um, line on testing here. Um, the general idea on that is it's not like kind of machine learning black box models and white box models. It's it's more around our unit tests. We should be building with ideas that um, what we're expecting the data to come in on paper, so very kind of prescribed type of uh, values. Whereas the end to end tests could be way more vague. The user could do random things with their mouse and um, yeah, what happens if they click a button 80 times when you're only expecting to press it once kind of thing. So um, there's a lot more on literature um, that uh, you can look into if this does interest you at all. Um, but yeah, there's a good blog linked on these slides here. Um, Zoe will hopefully be able to find the, the link for these um, slides and chuck it chuck in the chat for you. But 
um, yeah, that, that blog post kind of goes into some of these different testing procedures in a bit more detail. So yeah, as I said, this is going to be a talk about unit testing. If I say testing from now on, I mean unit testing. So an implied unit testing. Now, in R, there's a really good package for unit testing, and that's the test that package. So you're definitely going to want to install it and then um, call library on it so we've got all the functions available to us. So let's create our first tests. And in order to create some tests, we're going to need a function. Now, these kind of um, techniques are really designed around testing functions rather than just random blocks of code. But you can always just take that random block of code and wrap it in a function. Um, the reason why it's got to be a function is because we need to be able to repeatedly call this code and run it with different arguments and values. It, it kind of doesn't make sense to run a, a test like a unit test against something static that never changes because you could just run that code and check that it gives you the values that you're expecting. It's kind of fixed. But anyway, um, this is where you find out that I'm not a very imaginative person. So I've created this really, really simple function, which is just doing x divided by y. So we'll build some tests up against this. Um, but yeah, I wanted to keep it a nice, simple example to start with. What you might have spotted, maybe you haven't built these into your function before, but this is something that we've called defensive programming. Um, so there's a, a blog linked at the bottom there, the 10 rules of defensive programming in R, um, but there's lots more kind of um, content, just general about defensive programming in various programming languages. The idea is, if our function is meant to be accepting numbers, which in this case we're doing division, it should be only accepting numbers for x and y. We should make sure that the user can't submit a character or a data frame to one of those arguments. So those first two things there are checking that x must be numeric, y must be numeric. Um, and we could build some other bits of logic here. So I'm expecting that because x and y could be vectors, they should be vectors of the same length. And then finally, you can't do anything divided by y, so um, there's a condition there that checks that y is not equal to zero. Um, let's create our first test. And this is what one might look like for this. Let's just break it down kind of um, line by line. So the, um, the first bit of this function, we start off calling the test that function. And Generally, you're only going to pass in two arguments to this. I, I don't even know what the other arguments to it are, but um, I think there are some. Um, but the two arguments that you're going to want to pass in are a description for what this test should do. Um, so I've, again, been very creative and imaginative. I've just said that my function correctly divides the values. When you actually are running these tests, if you get failures, it will bring up the kind of description that you put in there. So having Good descriptions in the same way as if you're doing like an R markdown or a quarto document naming the chunks will help you to navigate back through to find where your errors are happening. Um, so yeah, that's the first argument, just a description of what the, um, the test is actually going to do. And the second argument is a, an expression that's containing the kind of um, bits of code that you want to run and check the hand. So yeah, inside of this, you'll see that we're calling that function that we just created a couple of times. And that's going to run the code um, and get the, the values back out. And then these are the values that we're expecting to be returned by each of those function calls. So if you remember, my really creative function did um, x divided by y. So in that first example, 4 divided by 2, we're expecting 2. The next example, 1 divided by 4, we're expecting 0 0.25. Um, and then 
I think I've created the bug in that um, last example there. <laughs> the, um, my function should actually be 4 divided by 2, and I put 4 divided by 1. Um, it's like typo there, sorry. But um, yeah, the, the kind of final bit of this is that we're wrapping this in a, an expectation function. So test that provides these functions like expect equal. So what this is saying is we're expecting the first thing, the, the, the code that we've run, to be equal to an expected value. So if you run this, it should come and tell you that tests have passed and you'll be really happy. Um, and it gives nice little um, random emojis after the test as you run them. So in this case, I've got a nice little celebration, which is nice. Um, now, as a kind of hint, uh, there's, there's lots of different expect functions. We could rewrite most of these, like in, in that first example there, I'm showing expect less than. We could have said my function is less than 10, and we could expect equal, and in that case, we'd be expecting it to be equal to true. Um, but there's loads of like nice little helpers here, so we can say we expect that function to return a value that's less than 10, expect it to be greater than 0 0.2 in the next example, or even things like we expect the length of this function to be two items long. Um, one of my particular favourites, if you want to kind of dig into the documentation, which again is linked in the footer, um, there's expect snapshot. So when you've got something way more complicated that's maybe producing um, like a humongous data frame or a plot, you can say expect snapshots. And as you run the code, it will generate a kind of standard copy of that value. And the next time it's going to run and check, does the value equal the same thing as last time? So yeah, well worth digging into the documentation to test that to see all these nice little functions that exist. Now, a good way to lay out your um, test is with this um, arrange, act, and assert method. So I pretty much always use this in my tests, that I'll start writing my test by just putting in these three comments. Um, you're going to start with the arrange section, move to the act section, and finish off asserting. So what are those three things? In a range, what we're trying to do is set up the environment before running the function. So in this case, I'm just creating some values. Um, with this being such a simple example, kind of doesn't make sense to assign some variables to this, but maybe you've got to create a data frame beforehand or some other kind of complex bit of data. That's what you're handling in your range section. So you might want to create some sample values. The other thing that you might need to do, imagine if you had a function that needs to read a CSV. Um, you could, in your range section, create a temporary kind of fake CSV file that the, your function can load in and work from. If you're doing some things with some random data, then your tests need to be deterministic. So if we were to run this multiple times, but there's something random in the code, we're going to get different results and it's going to be hard and unpredictable to test. So one way of getting around that would be to set a random seed. I've got an example of that a little bit later on anyway. Um, and some other things that you might occasionally need to do, um, setting things like R options, um, occasionally you need to, um, or maybe set some environment variables. Um, you can do that in your arrange section. A good place to put it anyway. So once we've um, arranged, we need to act, and we act by calling the function that we want to test. So in this case, I, I'm running that function, my function, with those values x and y we've created in the arrange section, and I'm just saving that to a variable called actual. Now, once we've got our actual value, we can run some tests against it. And that's what happens in the assert section. So um, in this, we're saying we expect the actual value to be equal to the expected value. Now, of course, we can run this test now, 
and it gives a horrible error. <laughs> so in this case, what this is telling us, um, you can see it's saying failure, my function works. So that's that description that I, I mentioned earlier. It's pointing you to where your um, error happens. And it's telling us that it errors on line 11. So we can see on line 11, it's that expectation. And it, it's, it's given us something where it says 0.714 minus 0.714 equals some random value. So what that's telling us is the actual value is ever so slightly different from the expected value. Very, very small amount, but there's a slight difference. Um, and this was a little bit of an artificial example. I've, I've purposely locked one of the, um, the values off the ends of the expected value. But it's the kind of thing that can happen because computers don't store like um, decimal numbers as true values. It stores them with some arbitrary precision. So what we can do is we can change the tolerance. So what we're saying now in that expect equal is that we're expecting that these values are going to be within the, um, you know, 10 to the power of minus six. So about, is that within a millionth? Something like that anyway. Um, and now suddenly the, the test passes. So we can be happy. So yeah, it's a slightly artificial example. Um, by default, expect equal has um, a tolerance set to something like 10 to the power of minus eight. So it's usually good enough but yeah, sometimes you, you you might be building some test where you're never going to get a good precise enough value um, written in your code. So you can change the tolerance to be um, happy that your code's working close enough. So you might remember before we put those kind of um, defensive programming steps in, um, we want to test that as our code um, is passed in, you know, we test that function with those kind of edge case values. Does the function stop working? Does it give us an error? Um, so that's what I'm writing here. These are expect errors. So in this case, we need to wrap the kind of function in that expect error. And when it runs it, if that code fails, then our test passes. It, it seems a bit weird to say that we, we're expecting our code to, to fail and that's a good thing, but in this case, that's what we want. So we can build some tests using the expect error. Um, but I kind of mentioned before that um, uh, um, arrange act assert. It's a great way of laying out your code, but something like expect error fails because you've kind of mixing up your act with your arrange. So um, while it's a, a good way of laying out your, your tests, um, you might have to diverge from it occasionally. That's fine. Um, so here's a, a, another really unimaginative function example. But consider this case here. So we've got an if statement, what we call branched logic. So we need to think really carefully as we're building tests against this code, because it'd be really easy to write a test that only ever checks one of those cases. So in this case, I'm, I'm just showing that this example, I'm writing my first test suite and I'm giving that a description. So I'm, I'm separating these two bits out in my head and in the code. But the first one is it's going to return that value X if X is bigger than Y. So I've got an example with that. And then I'm doing the exact same thing where um, we're expecting that value of y. Now, in that y case, I've, I've put two things in because it's, you know, if x is greater than y, we're returning x. But if x is equal to y, then we're returning y. So that's why I've built those two separate edge cases there. That I'm, I'm checking that kind of boundary point of when our values are expecting to change. So, yeah, how do we design good tests? And this is very much a non-exhaustive list, but um, for now, um, at least how I tend to think of these, you need to look at your function, consider what are all of those arguments to those functions, and very specifically, what are we expecting as the range of values to go in 
and yeah, values that are kind of very specifically out of bounds, not values that should be causing errors or shouldn't run. So we need to check those two kind of things there. Um, and in the edge cases, uh, um, at what point do things kind of flip between different bits of logic? And then have we considered all the different paths in our code? So a formal way of checking that is something called code coverage. And you can have um, bits of code that run all of your tests and then check which lines of code have actually been run and whether any areas of your code base that were missed. Um, so something that you can look and put in your own leisure if you're interested. Um, there's a, a package in R called um, CovR, so C-O-V-R, that handles that for you. And then the kind of last point there is that what are the results that we're expecting to get from the function? And have we checked the entire kind of range of values that we might be expecting to get from that? Um, now obviously, if you, you know, in our division example, we, we can't possibly write a test that checks every single combination of um, x divided by y possible. But maybe we'd want to think of things of what happens if x is negative and y is positive? What happens if x is um, negative and y is negative? Um, so those are the kind of decisions that you need to make and just think about how you're building these tests up. Um, I'd say it's very much more an art than a science. Um, there's definitely never a right or wrong answer. Um, but it's one of those ones where more tests is probably always better than less tests. So the, the question is, yeah, why, why should we care? Why should we create tests in the first place? So the first point is one that happens to me almost on a daily basis when I'm writing tests. You will uncover existing issues in your own code as you start thinking about those test cases and th those different things. It kind of forces you to look at your code again, possibly in a new light. And you suddenly go, I was an idiot there. Um, and it improves your own code. And once you've built these good tests, it's going to defend you from future changes that break existing functionality. So I'm sure most of us here have wrote code, come back a week later, um, gone, oh, it'd be good if it also did this, you make that change. And then a month later, you suddenly go, why is that other thing now not working? And it turns out that you accidentally introduced some weird edge case or you haven't considered. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, it's another one of those ones where it happens all the time um, to me. So building these tests, if you've got a yeah a good test suite that you're running constantly as you're checking your code uh, and, and changing it, um, it'll help you uncover these problems early. Um, that third point. So one of the big arguments that you might see over in various R blogs and things about like, um, oh, the Tidyverse has changed their API design again and it's suddenly broken my code and everything that was great before is now terrible. Um, building unit tests can help you spot those changes sooner um, before they become an issue. So with the NHSR plot the dots package that we developed, um, they, th there was a lot of usage of um, I think it was the across function from dplyr and they changed the um the way that that worked a couple of months back from the way that it handles one of the arguments and it suddenly started for loads and loads of warnings um up in the code so that was a good indication that oh we need to go and kind of change this code because in the future that functionality could suddenly break um or yeah at, at least it would give users really annoying warning messages as to try to run our code. And the other thing that I'd argue tests are great for is that acting as a, an additional form of documentation. Um, so if you're writing loads and loads of comments in your code, there is a kind of um, a, a, a kind of camp of people that say that comments in code are bad. Um, yeah, if you're writing loads of comments that say, 
this thing doesn't work if you pass in this value, but it works if you pass in that value. Those are tests that you can create. Um, so you know, they can be very valuable in that regard. And if you've got someone new coming and looking at your code, just reading through you know, the, the documentation that you might have wrote, it's only ever going to be so good. Personally, I know what I tend to do if I'm looking at a new R function is I just scroll down to the examples section and look at how is someone running this. Um, your tests are acting a bit like that as well. And they're giving a, a, a way for people to see how is that thing meant to be used. So um, I want to just kind of move on to a more complex example. Um, in this case, I've, I've built this function called my big function. I, I did warn you that I'm not very imaginative. Um, so yeah, hopefully you're using better names for your function. But this is probably a pattern that is very familiar to us. Um, we have some code at the top of the first few lines that are connecting to a database and it's grabbing some data. Um, because yeah, you, our databases always handle dates in a weird way. Um, in this case, it's, the, the example is kind of meant to be that the data stores as a character. You know, we need to convert that back to a useful value like a date. So we pass it through to the loop date function. Um, we might then need to grab some reference data from a CSV. Um, so we've got a chunk that loads that file in. And then the final block is um, doing a, a filtering join, um, you know, making sure that all of the um, items in the main data frame are in the conditions that we're looking at. Um, we're doing a count on the date, so just doing like a, a, a simple how many things per day are there. And producing just a, a simple little GG plot object. Where would you begin writing tests for this? How do you test for all those different possibilities and you, you know combinations of the values that you might possibly get into this function? Um, the answer to that really is to simplify everything. So I would break this down into lots of simpler functions. So as I kind of said earlier on, we've got that chunk that's for grabbing data from the database, a chunk that's for getting some conditions from a CSV. Um, there's a chunk there that's summarizing the data that's immediately passed into um, a plot function. So this is what I'm going to end up doing. I'm, I'm going to split that out into a function that gets the data from SQL. I'm going to create a function that gets the, the relevant conditions out of that CSV file. I'm going to create a little function that summarizes the data. And then a function that creates the plot. And then we can go back to that original function and refactor it to just use these new functions. So I've just kind of reordered it a little bit. So yeah, we grab that conditions first. Um, and then we use um, a dplyr pipe. Well, a base R pipe actually, isn't it? to flow through and hopefully do exactly the same as we did before. Um, I mean, this is going to be significantly easier to test because we can independently test those individual units of code. If we're trying to test that original function, you'd almost argue that's an integration test because so much stuff going on. Um, and particularly if you're trying to think of different combinations of values that might go into your complex function. Um, now we can test the individual cases one by one um, and make it easier for us to work with. So anyway, let's let's build a test for one of those functions. Let's set the summarize data function. So this is that part where we're taking that data that we've grabbed from SQL already. And we're taking that data that we've loaded from the CSV file. And we're going to run it through this is semi join and count. Now, one observation that we could make is this function has been designed to accept the data from those two functions before. But we don't need to run those functions. We can create some data that kind of fits what we're expecting from those um, functions. So 
yeah, we, we'll build up some tests. We're going to use that same arrange act and assert um, layout that I described before. So the first thing that I'm going to kind of think about is what should that data from the SQL database look like? Um, I'm expecting two columns in that data. I'm expecting date and I'm expecting condition. Um, but for the purposes of this test, I don't really need a, a, a date object. I don't need an actual description of what the condition is. So for the date, I'm just randomly sampling some um, integers. Um, and for the condition, I'm just randomly sampling from the letters A, B, and C. This should be sufficient to build the test with. Um, I'm also like just using some random sampling here because I want to make a table that I'm checking when I count the values. I'm, I'm getting some actual counts from. So if I was just have one value over and over again, I'd just get a count of one. And that might not give me enough information to truly answer is the counting part working correctly? Um, so yeah, I'm just going to let R randomly generate some data for me. But of course, randomly generating data is bad for tests because it's not going to consistently give us the same results. Unless we kind of set the random seed. So directly before setting that, uh, creating that table, I'm just setting a random seed to any old number. It, it really doesn't matter. But yeah, so long as that tests are run with that same seed, they're going to give us the same results. So yeah, I'm also going to need to simulate that conditions data. And I'm going to need to make sure that the conditions that I set in that data frame above are represented in this. So um, I'm just using A and B here. And I'm, I'm not using the full set of values because again, I'm using a semi-join. I'm, I'm doing a filtering join. So I want to test that part of the code works. So I'm making sure that I'm using a subset of the values from the data frame in this. So the next thing that I want to think about is what is the expectation of this when I run the function? What, what are the values going to look like when um, I've actually run the function? So what I'm going to show you is a bad way of writing tests, um, but it's a way that does work. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is in my R console, I'm going to run those first few lines of code, and then I'm going to run my function. And I'm going to see what the values are that um, that function gives me, and I'm going to use that as the expectation from the function. Now, I say this is bad because what if our function doesn't work correctly? I've run the function, it's given me some values, and I'm going to plonk it into my test case, and then I'm going to say, my function works perfectly forevermore with these sets of values, and I've kind of baked in that um, incorrect assumption, wherever it might be, um, directly into my test case. It's given me false assurance. So if you can avoid this kind of technique, you know, you want to be writing tests that are built kind of um, purely from working out almost on pen and paper. But in a simple example like this function, you could go back and kind of verify, yeah, it is working as I'm expecting. Um, kind of that static code analysis um, and be happy that the tests are good. So that's what I've done here. I've kind of gone through and got those random values um, that were generated, build my expected, uh, expected data frame, and then finally I can just um, do an expect equal and be happy. Um, so, yeah, as I say, it's, it's not the best way of writing tests to do it that way, um, but it can work sometimes. So that's a, a very brief introduction to unit tests. Um, I hope that it's inspired you to kind of go and read further, learn a bit more. Um, a few kind of points. Um, you can use um, tests with kind of any old R project. Um, so there's a lot of tooling that's really been geared around 
um, using tests with packages. So um, if you read up on a lot of the documentation, um, then yeah, you, you're going to be going down a kind of a package development route, which isn't a bad thing. Um, it'll help you develop better coding practices and um, it'll make it easy to reuse your code in the long run. Um, so there's um, one of those free open books, um, the, the R Packages book, um, and it's got three whole chapters on testing. Um, so well worth looking into. Um, yeah, not least for learning how to write packages if you're not familiar with it, it's a good book for learning that. But the, the testing section should um, be good standalone anyway. Um, if you haven't seen a use this package before, um, uh, Zoe should be the, the queen and do a, a webinar in the future on this, I suppose, because she absolutely um, loves the package. But there are two great functions in that. So um, use test that will kind of create the folder structure for putting in all your tests ready for you. Um, and then use test is just this really neat function where imagine you've got your file open here in our studio. You say use test and it's going to look at the name of that file and it's going to create a test file in the right folder with a similar name to your um, file. So imagine you've got a file called um, you know, myscript.r. Um, it'll create a, a test file called test myscript.r. Um, for some kind of more advanced steps, um, the with R package is amazing. Um, the, the basic idea of it is if you've got things that are temporary, um, like creating files that you only want to exist during the test, or a database connection that you want to properly close at the end of running your function. Um, WIVR has a lot of stuff for what's called a um, deferred execution. So when your function runs, um, whether it fails to finish, you know, gives an error or um, completes successfully, it can run some extra code at the end, such as deleting files or closing the the database connection. Um, with R is absolutely a, 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 an amazing kind of friends to use with um, test that. So definitely look into that. Um, and very much a, a topic for a, a webinar by itself would be um, mocking in unit testing. Um, the basic idea on that is imagine that function that we created my big function when we refact it to use all of those other functions we still are left with that kind of problem of testing my big function of it's got all of those other dependencies that are running um what mocking can do is replace the functions on the fly that it's calling so instead of calling my database connection function it will do a pretend function um, and it will just return a value. So you, you can kind of um, short circuit bits of code to just test those individual bits that you need to test at that moment in time. Um, it's yeah, great if you are having database connection tests because you might need to run a query that could take forever in production. Um, or maybe you want to run your tests on GitHub Actions, which has absolutely no access into your internal network infrastructure. So you can look into the mockery package for um, kind of tips on how to handle some of that stuff. Um, and the, the other thing that I've just realized that I really should have put as a bullet point is um, look at other people's GitHub repositories. So um, you, you, there's a lot of stuff on the stress unit now that we've tried to put unit tests in. Um, there's a lot of the stuff in um, say NHSR plot the dots where we've built um, unit tests to check the package and actually works as expected. Um, so yeah, have a look at other people's code for inspirations. Um, but yeah, um, thank you for your time. And if we've got any time for questions, um, let's go for them. Otherwise, there's my email address or um, better yet, DM me on Slack. I'll probably be quick to respond there. Um, yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Tom. We do have questions. Uh, one question is quite long, but it's got lots of points to it, which is really good. Um, how can I write unit test fun for functions within an R project that isn't within a package? For example, if I have 10 tests within a test.r file, how does R flag that a test is failing when I run the code? And will R stop the code from running if there's a failing test? Yes, so um, I'm not as familiar with running tests, not in a package structure. Um, but what I was doing within this quarter document is so long as you've loaded that code up in your environment in the first place, when you run that test, it's just going to give you in the console um, a report saying, you know, that part run, that part isn't. Um, I'm not sure whether you can get it to quite work like with, um, with a, um, a package. So in a package, you can just say, um, I think it's like DevTools test, um, run that function, and it will start running through and create a report at the end saying, like, all these scripts run um, passes, failures, errors, uh, yeah, warnings, uh, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, you can use test up just kind of in the console in that way. Um, I'm not too sure whether it's going to give you all the functionality, um, but have a look at just migrating to um, a, a kind of um, package structure because a lot of the time you can kind of get away with just calling the folder with all your scripts um, R, um, and that's almost most of the way to getting it to run as a package. Um, certainly what I do with a lot, I, I use a lot of a, a package structure with no intention of ever getting it to install as a package, um, certainly never reaching Fran. I'm just using it for some of the additional benefits that I get with um, the, the tooling that's available. Uh, and sorry, what's the second part of the question on that? Um, if you have 10 tests running within the test.r file, how yeah. does r flag that a test is failing when I run the code? So again, I'm answering this from a um, how I'm using it in a kind of package structure. When it's does that test um, report, what it tends to do um, is it will run through and it will try and um, run everything in that um, Test. And if it hits an expectation that fails, it kind of flags it up as a failure. Um, so it's a bit, I sometimes find it a bit weird, particularly when I'm flicking between Python development and R development. But R counts tests by the number of expectations that you write, not by the number of test that calls that you make. So imagine you write test that with four expectations, that's going to say four tests. And Maybe the first one succeeds, the second one fails, it's going to try and run the third one and the fourth one and flag them up um, as appropriate. Um, though by default, there is a kind of um, limit for how many errors they all um, kind of handle before stopping. And I think it's around 10 errors. Once it's hit about 10 errors, it's just going to go, oh, no, I'm not going to continue anymore with your, your code. Um, that can be changed, but. Um, I tend to leave it at that default because if I'm starting to get that many errors, it's probably something stupid that I've like deleted a comma somewhere and um, it's just breaking everything at that point. So I think you've kind of answered the will R stop the code from running if there's a failing test. And it doesn't, does it? It just gives you the output at the end and says how many broke, how many yeah. passed. Uh, I mean, if you have a if you have broken code in your test, that might cause the tests to stop. Um, I can't quite remember. Um, try I'm thinking in terms of packages, I suppose. Yeah, mm. yeah generally um, what it's going to do is it's going to run through and just try as much as it can and um, warn you about the errors that it finds. And the other question, <clears throat> which is a different one, would be, would you include the tests in a GitHub repository? Yeah. Yeah, your, your, your test. So if you look at, um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, the NHSR plot the dots one um, is, is a great example. Um, the, there's a the folder in there called tests, and it has all of the tests included in that. The reason we definitely want it included in your GitHub repository is um, you can set actions up on GitHub to run your tests. So every time that you start pushing changes up to GitHub. Um, you can have it on a pull request, run those tests, 
and give a, a status flag to say your code is okay or you know, maybe you don't want to merge this pull request just yet. Uh, that's it for the questions, but we had a two, two lovely comments that I'm going to put up for the record for YouTube. Thank you for the presentation, Learn Lots. It's less scary. I think that's really important. It's less scary. And another person said, thank you. I found the idea of unit tests quite daunting before, but feeling really inspired now. And these are really lovely comments. Thank you so much for those. Um, they're now on YouTube as well as in the uh, chat. And I, I think thought that's... I thought that. I mean, um, I'm glad that you're feeling less daunted. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't feel daunted, but you should also probably expect to feel like um, at times when you're writing tests that you're pulling out your own hair. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it can be a very frustrating process, um, which is yeah, it, it's kind of nature of the beast. You're doing it for a good purpose that you're going to make your code um, give greater assurance really to your code base in the future um, and instill more confidence. Um, yeah. So yeah, so certainly don't be put off by um, writing tests. And you can start off really simple and just make a few little tests. Yeah, you know, hopefully the most important things, and build it up over time as you kind of gain more confidence and understanding of these tools. I think that's very key because the first tests I did were terrible tests in a package, but they were running off SQL Server data and took for for eight for lot, eons to run too long to run it was uh, they were terrible but they always are when you first start that's what happens and it gets easier and then when you suddenly get a test that runs really well it's a very good feeling and it keeps you going and when it picks up a bug that you've in introduced by accident that's even better and that's what we're looking for so that's really great Thank you so much for that, Tom. You've said about use this. I do love that package. And with that challenge, I will challenge back to you. I want to know more about mockery. I want an so if I do a webinar and use this, you do a webinar on mockery and a little bit more on unit tests. <laughs> there we go. We're challenging each other. <laughs> um, thank you to everybody who came today and for everybody who watches the YouTube video in the future, because you can catch up again through our YouTube channel which you probably will find if you're watching this in catch up. Um, and just to remind everybody that we have these events every, uh, we have the monthly and we just have volunteers. I say just, we have the best volunteers through the community who come and give us talks. So if you want to be one of those volunteers, just get in touch and share some of the things that you've worked on or want to share with the community. We'd be really happy to have you come along and speak to us. We've also got the NHSR conference coming up as well in 2023, because I guess this is going out for posterity. And that's in October on the 17th and 18th of October. And the tickets are out now for in-person, but we also are doing it hybrid, so virtually too. So just check out the website and have a look at what we're up to and get involved. And um, hopefully we'll see Tom again. Thank you so much with uh, some more unit testing love, let's say, because we've had a lot going on today where people really appreciated it. Thanks for the introduction. And I think that we can close the meeting. Thanks Thank right. you very much, everyone. Bye bye.